our speaker, Kelly Benson, with the Good Samaritan Outreach. Are you remember? Yeah. These are a year old, but I don't know what we've been doing in 2020. Hi, <laughs> um, um, so thanks for letting me come out and share some things with you on what we're doing. Um, I'll, uh, I want to start off, I know the lights are dim and you just have a full stomach, but I want you to um, uh -huh. use your imagination, think back to your creative years. Um, about what you thought of when, let's see if I get this thing here. <clears throat> so what superpower did you want as a kid? Maybe you still want it now, I don't know. But, um, I want some class participation. Anybody want to be? The whole gamut of everything. Yeah. X-ray vision and fly oh, over and run fast. All right, anybody else? Enjoy. Yeah, I wanted to be able to fly. Fly, yeah, I think that's kind of a no-brainer. Um, yeah, there's, I think there's a lot of us, we think about those creative kind of imaginary worlds we could live in in fiction, and it, it, it would be exciting to have some superpower. One of the things that I had always thought would be cool would be to be invisible, where you could just, you know, turn it invisible. Um, but obviously, to turn it on when I wanted to and turn it off when I didn't want to. I didn't want to be always invisible. And I wanted to kind of use that thought as we think about our um, superpower and knowing that invisibility is a cool thing unless you can't not be invisible. Um, and by that, I want to reflect on a movie. It's kind of the whole reason I wanted to bring a PowerPoint because this, um, you remember that movie about, I don't know, 20 years ago or more? Uh, maybe 30 years now, I guess, close to it. Anyway, it was that the memoirs of an invisible man. And if you remember the story, here's a guy, Nick Holloway. He's just a high-end exec guy. Uh, he goes to this high-tech meeting thing back in the 90s. That probably wasn't as high-tech as today. But, you know, still the idea was they were presenting something. And because of some, because of his life or whatever, he, he didn't go to the meeting, but he was in the building. You know, catastrophe happened. And next thing you know, he's the only one that didn't escape. And so he had this reaction to what happened. In the building. So I want to play this clip because I feel like this is kind of a, um, I mean, hopefully this plays it here. I have it on backup on YouTube if it doesn't work. I might just do that. All right, hopefully you'll hear this. Oh, hold on a second. I had all this techno stuff figured out. Hold on a second, folks at home. Wow. Hmm. Well. All right, well, all that work, and then you're not going to, I'm going to pull around this one. You won't be able to see it much, maybe you'll hear it. That might be enough. You can imagine what you, you're already using your imagination, so maybe it'll be semi-clear. This is a bad video anyway, as far as the quality of it. Oh, come on. Okay, so Conference, doctor, last Wednesday, I was inside when it happened. I beg your pardon? Give me a thought. It could be what you just. Does the word invisible mean anything to you? Where's the professor? In the park, taking a stroll. Come on, we 
and we're gonna lose them. Relax. This is a sprung. I never, I never dreamed. I never told me. Um, open your coat. Show me the rest of you. Trust me, it's all the same. Oh dear God. Look, there's gotta be another psychotron or whatever it was, right? Can't you just take me there and turn me back? I swear I'll forget the whole thing. No lawsuits, no recriminations. No harm, no foul. Our research had nothing to do with invisibility. This was a completely random, freakish reaction. Savers, don't tell me this. But what are you doing here? You should be with me, with us in the lab. We must begin replicating all the variables. Begin to explore how this happened. Begin to explore? That's not good enough. You're going to help me now. I would if I could believe you, but it's going to take time. I don't have time. I want my molecules back. Look at me. Tim. All right, so if you didn't see much more than just hear a little bit of that, uh, let me see if I can get this going back again, hopefully. All right, so the whole point was, um, I got him on video. The whole point about that was he needed to get help now. He was now invisible. He didn't want to stay invisible. This was a, obviously a problem for him in that situation. So this whole movie really has nothing to do with what we're saying, other than the fact that this is a man that is now invisible. He doesn't want to be this way. And I think when you consider some of the things about what our mission statement as a Good Samaritan outreach, um, for those of you familiar with the Bible referencing there, that is actually the reaction to Jesus saying the greatest commandment. When asked, what is the greatest commandment? And ultimately, love God by your heart, soul, mind, love your neighbor as yourself. And then someone asked him, who is my neighbor? Now, why do you think they would ask, who is my neighbor? What do you think? I'll just help. Justification why I don't have to love everybody. I don't want to love everybody. I hate most people. I only want to like the ones I like. That's where, in a nutshell, ultimately why a person would ask that question. I don't want to have to love everybody. I just want to love the people that I like. And then I can love them fully, and I can totally reject the people I don't have anything to do with because I don't like them, I don't, you know, whatever, we're not equal in some way. And so when I think about this concept in Scripture that Jesus says, he tells them that story of two people that bypassed the guy on the side of the road, and one stopped and helped them. And the one that helped them was ultimately one that would have been regarded as, these two people have problems with each other. This is a Samaritan who was looked down upon by the Jews, and yet here's this, Samaritan who doesn't even care what the man, who the man is, he recognizes a need and helps him. And I think from that perspective, um, in the case of the man in the movie, you could argue, if you don't remember the story much, you could argue that he kind of caused his own problem. If he'd just gone to the meeting like everybody else did instead of hide out and try to take a nap, then he wouldn't have had that happen. He would have heard the alarm and gone out like everybody else. He didn't hear the alarms, he didn't know, and he got turned invisible for the rest of his life. So, when you think about this in context of the, some of the people we get to help at the men's shelter, is we can see how some of their problems are self-inflicted. And probably, in some ways, all their problems are self-inflicted, to some level. But it's the idea of what the Good Samaritan gets to do is help people who feel invisible. Maybe because they don't know how to take the next step to become uninvisible, just like the man there. We don't know how to deal with you. You've never had that problem. And for many of us, I think when we think about what homelessness is, most of us probably don't really know. We've never had it. We've had a support system of people. Maybe we've always had good jobs. We were smart enough to have a savings account. We're smart enough to diversify our income or our lifestyles. Or we're not dumping everything into a one person or one drug or one whatever and it ruined their life and so i think in some ways when we get to help people become uninvisible to be visible again um, there's something very rewarding about that and so that's what i think as we look at what the good samaritan is um hopefully just the the, the reality of just like the superheroes remember the little batman things are pow and whack and all that stuff and you know that idea that this is where we have to tackle the problems the enemy in this case the enemy can even seem like, um, if we just personify it too much, it's the homeless person. Instead of going, there's something deeper behind the homeless person that causes them to be homeless. In the same way, if we looked at all sin the same, we might say the same thing. Well, all of us have sin, but there's something that's causing us. There's some weakness in us. And I think this is one of the, the things that, as I'm describing that, what the Good Samaritan, what our hone in on, uh, what we're honing in on is how do we help them stay unhomeless? We don't want them to remain homeless. We realize that might be a bad spot in their life, 
um, but to be able to take it to another level where they can get help for that. So looking at just the real nuts and bolts about what we've done, this is our 10th year anniversary. We have some cool things in mind to do for our 10 years anniversary, but COVID's kind of messing some of that up, but we're still going to do something. But um, what we had in mind probably won't get to do it quite to the level we wanted to. Um, just a few things about us. You established 2010. We're a 501c3. Um, probably the, the biggest thing that, and this is where I'm going to focus most of this presentation on, is the Life Builder Program. And there's probably other names of something similar that you've heard of or been part of. Um, the Life Builder Program is designed to give them tools to become visible, basically, if you want to say it that way, using this cliche. Um, ways to help them understand how to take the next step. Some of it's real fundamental and simple, and this is across the board in nearly every shelter. If you're doing more than providing a bed and meal, you have to provide guidance how to keep your own bed, how to provide your own meal, how to get your own life back in order. And so some of the things we're doing is with this Life Builder program um, is uh, it's just creating some better curriculum, better one-on-one -on -one mentorship opportunities for them, um, connecting them with better resources. And so this is, again, something that's pretty standardized probably across shelters. But as far as we're concerned, this is, our, this is a shelter we're part of. And we want to make sure that they have what they need to do those things. Um, probably the mo most exciting thing this year, if you're familiar with the Parents Club back, um, they closed their doors, you know, into the last year. And as it so happened, um, Janet Daniels was running the thrift store part of that. When the roof blew off, I mean, she, they were going to have to end up, there's a series of other things too, but they're going to have to close. And she was really not wanting to close, you know, um, but um, we suggested, I went over there and talked to her about using the uh, sanctuary part that we had at the where the Good Samaritan Outreach is. And say, you know, that is not a very um, productive, um, even safe place for us. It's been a troublemaker because it's a big warehouse. It's probably poorly locked, and poorly secured, or had been. And so it's just, there was constantly problems in there. Um, and say, you know, if we had someone in there that would fill it with something good and have a real vested interest in making sure it's secure and managed well, she was so excited about it. And so in January, she opened her doors there and renamed it as the GSO Thrift Store. And um, what she's been able to do, the fun she makes from thrift stores, so much like the Parents Club run almost exactly the same way, because it's her doing it, but taking the funds we make from that and be able to turn back into the community. And so some of the things that we were able to do so far, and I know this is probably a very limited um, list of things that we've, um, these are probably pretty generic too, um, but just a few things that some of the contributions we've been able to make to the Head Start program and some of those school programs, both in backpacks and clothes and shoes, as well as money, um, able to do things for several of the people that are um, not homeless, but they're just in financial straits, financially destitute, low income um, issues. We've been able to provide not only for those that either can't go to a shelter or don't want to go to a shelter, they still can come and take a shower. Which you, we have a shower set up just for them and clothes. She constantly ministers to them. And so there's become almost like another mentoring opportunity to help those people on top of the men we have in the shelter itself. Um, and so that's just through the thrift store side what we've been able to do. And probably one of the bigger things is being able to help people that can't afford prescription medicine to be able to pay for it um, through the funds we make at the thrift store. Uh, to me, all those are great opportunities for us to engage those men and seeing what it looks like really close in proximity. I mean, they're really they're located in the same roof, technically. There's a wall that divides them all. But to know they get to see this kind of um, community outreach under their roof, and it gives them exposure to what it means to really help those other people who are invisible in a sense. Who, you know, we think about those who might fall into the invisibility con, you know, um, idea is maybe the elderly to some degree. If you've been to nursing homes sometimes, you, it just breaks your heart to know how some people are just almost left there. Um, you know, and then you think about the uh, orphans. We take on foster kids sometimes and, you know, just to see how some of their home lives are just totally abandoned, the disabled, um, and the homeless, and we could probably list multiple other categories of people that are kind of regarded as invisible. We just don't, they're a problem we don't know how to handle. And we don't know how to do it right. And so we oftentimes as a culture just kind of put them aside and, you know, and maybe not even ill will and, and evil intent in it, but to know, I think as, as our mission is to take what we have the opportunities to do and turn this 
the thrift store side as well as some other life builder programs to help these men take ownership in their own life and maybe for the first time in their life feel like they have a way to be able to know how to take the next step so they can become go from an invisible person that doesn't even know how to handle their problems to seeing a light at the end of the tunnel and seeing you know a mentored program where they're helping each other or are you talking about just having that accountability with people i mean this is the same concept on a different scale different level but it's still it's um it's what it is um just a few things that so this is really how we're doing some things is what we mentioned just through the gso the the thrift store part but who are needing to help and who are having help us um um we're having several counselors right now come down and volunteer their time and need help with us in different ways counseling each of the guys individually we do group counseling now and that, that may not sound like something that is unique because it probably should have been happening anyway but over 2020 and 2019 we've began begun to do those things more systematically and i think that has been probably a huge aspect of um, or huge help in make, getting some of these guys out of homelessness i mean the neat thing is and some of the issues on the cards again this was before we even had the uh, thrift store but we assisted this is in 2018 the numbers are probably about the same for 2019 we didn't see a major influx of people coming through there um, during this COVID thing but it's about the same but assisted about 327 men throughout the year um, we serve meals and not just the men there but also as people need help need need food as i mentioned at the gso thrift store and at the shelter when people need food we try to help them out with it that's always just a key in right there probably one of our biggest um items we need oftentimes when we have we go through the food banks we get a lot of it we have some other sources of food uh, services that we, we use um but that has been especially through what janet's able to do at the thrift store is there's so many families that don't have any food and they'll just come there and she'll help them get a couple baskets full of food or a couple of bags full of food uh, pretty regularly i mean and there's always this challenge of when do we become enabling um basically laziness and unwillingness to work for something uh, that is a, a risk and so what we're trying to do through the life builder program at least those we have more access and more opportunity to influence the guys at the shelter because we have an eight o'clock meeting every morning uh, we meet just to kind of tell the, the chores for the day kind of a maintenance housekeeping thing but also Try to find out where they're at on the, the previous day's assignments, you know, getting driver's license and birth certificates and social security cards. Only the mid shelter had has had and probably will always have to some degree a bad reputa reputation just because these are typically men i mean we're only a men's shelter and so i mean um, that tends to have that stereotype of prisoner druggie you know gangster and honestly i can say this with a lot of confidence partly because of our volunteer status and our involvement it, we have seen a drastic difference between the guys uh, and their attitudes I mean, some of them do come from prison, but you would never, you probably would never know that. It's not like they wave it around and talk about it all the time. In fact, some of these guys are so hungry to have a positive mentor that when they get to see that, they really do fall in love with it. And I think that's the neat thing about what you guys can help us offer is probably most importantly, in my opinion, is your wisdom and your experience and your courage to share your story, your hope, your dreams with someone that may not feel like they even know how to connect with their own. Um, I don't want to end with this thing. We're doing a, a, a raffle for um, a rifle, a ra rifle raffle. Um, this was one of our 10 year um, anniversary kind of celebration uh, giveaway or yeah, raffling things. Um, it's a custom made rifle. It's over there at McAllister Tactical. You want to take a look at it? I have some some uh, tickets if you'd like to buy one. Um, they're, I think they're $20 a piece. And, six for a hundred um but the money goes towards getting us first two things primarily we are trying to raise money to do have a more permanent director we don't have a director right now we have a lot of deep volunteer base so it just has made it work we do need a director i think that's an important thing um, secondly um, we're developing some curriculum and talking with several different 
shelters. One up in Muskogee, the Gospel Rescue Mission has been really instrumental in giving us a lot of tools. But some of it does cost money, and so we're trying to figure out how we can do that. And so the money, that's what our hope is, that we can raise enough money to be able to do those things. Like I said, most of the thrift store operating, the revenue that comes from that is going directly into the community. And it has really been a blessing to us. And we feel pretty strongly convicted that we need to first and foremost on that side, especially turn that money and help McAllister folks, whether they're homeless or not. If we can help people in need, and that's where we want to be the Good Samaritan, to be kind of an example of what a Good Samaritan would be. Not better than any other shelter for, by any means, but just we want to model that well. And so um, if you have any questions or thoughts, I'd love to hear them. Otherwise, I'm kind of... Do you know how many homeless are in McAllister at the moment? Well, there is, um, as far as I don't know how full the women's shelter is right now. Um, the youth shelter, there's, I think there's still about you know, five or six, seven, less, less than 10, I think for sure. Last time I checked, it was two weeks ago, I went by there and talked to him. But we have right now about um, 15. Um, I think the women's shelter has more than that, but I'm not sure on that. But there is a large, sure, and I don't know the number on that community that doesn't go to the shelter. Um, there's different places in town or in the woods, out, you know, perimeters of town where they hang out and do their thing. Um, our goal really is to find ways to get into those places and be a positive influence to them and maybe do the same sort of thing that maybe they'll never be in a building and they'll never um, fall through one of our curriculums in an official sense, but to be able to take that to them where they're at and to know ultimately it's kind of a reshift in how you think about yourself, um, for a homeless person especially, that helps them take the next step into recovery from addictions or whatever else is keeping them homeless. So I don't know exactly, but I know there's easily 60 across the shelters I know of. Are most of them local or are they from out of town? Um, well, there is two levels of homelessness. There is the kind of the, the transient. They're going to be homeless. They're just chronic. Um, they'll use their welcome to move to the next town. There's not really a way that we know of, as of yet how to stop all that um, because they'll all have a story of it. They stayed with a cousin for three weeks and you know, didn't work right. out. But, and maybe that's true, but I think there's enough of them that probably more than half are not those guys. They're not chronic. They're just local. Um, now they, unfortunately, a lot of them have been, since they're, and they've been, as a kid, they've been nearly homeless as children. And so they whether it's foster system, and that's not homelessness, I realize that, but they're in that kind of environment where, you know, you, you get some great ones and some bad ones, and the experience as a kid, I can only imagine, I'm sure that's not a positive, that great of a positive experience anyway, but to know many of them have come from that kind of environment, and they just graduate out, and now what? And so they're, they don't have a lot of, I mean, especially the guys we meet, the younger ones, um, it almost always, it just, there's a natural, you get in trouble somehow. Usually most of their criminal style of things, if you want to say their, their jail time, is usually due to, to being on drugs at some point. Um, and then um, the other one is warrants for past due tickets. I mean, so you, it's not like these are mass murders and rapists. Um, and we haven't had anybody that we know of, and we do a criminal background check, and we haven't had anybody that's a very serious, you know, in that regard, where we feel like they're a life threat to somebody else in a long time three years at least. It's been a while, but um, I, I talked to, and, and he was homeless, but um, he had animals. He had two dogs with him. And he said that he couldn't get into the shelters because of his animals. Is that true, or is there a place for them to go? Well, the not true statement is we just had a guy leave like a month ago that had a dog there um, as a service dog, and so he was there. Um, now, the thing is, there's a lot of abuse with that because uh -huh. um, they can use that as going, hey, I got to stay here with my dog all day. You know, I can't just let the dog run around. And you're going, well, the problem is everybody else has to leave. So we, from 8 to noon, they're up and they're either in meetings. Hopefully, most of them have gone to work. Right now, we have over 50% got jobs. We're just trying to help get them on a budget so they can get used to. And then we have those counselors and case managers helping them get more permanent housing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so they're supposed to be out by noon. Right. And they don't come back till five. And so when you have a guy that says, I have a dog, I have to stay here all day. It does put the whole nature of what we're trying to do. Right. It puts it at risk a little bit. And so we've kind of made some different policies. If it's a legitimate service dog, 
we'll do what we can. We're not going to tell someone, don't come here with your dog. But the problem is just knowing how many of them are just, I need somebody to pet so I feel better about myself. And I'm not saying that it has no value, but the problem is it's, it jeopardizes a lot of the, the uniformity, that the, the control we can have over, because we, since, especially since we don't have a director now, we can get volunteers for four or five hours at a time. If we can do one in the morning and one in the evening, it kind of works out fine. And we have different disciplinary kind of guys that are there more, I mean, almost all of them are ex-military. So there's a little bit of that ex-military DOC kind of attitude, which isn't bad. I mean, sometimes I try to urge them, don't be so heavy on the discipline. I mean, be disciplinary and show some compassion too. I mean, know how to balance that out so you're not just cracking a bull whip. So have you reached out to like the AARP Foundation? Yeah, they actually, there's a big group of them. I don't say big with the COVID thing, that's drastically reduced, but they, they work with Janet at the thrift store, and so they go help there, and they're able to come over and do some volunteer work with us. Usually it's more like cleaning stuff, more than counseling, but they are. So we have a representation from the AARP at the thrift store. Because they actually talk about the dogs, and they yeah. do internships, and, um, and they, I know with COVID, they're close. Right, yeah, they could. I used to work with them. So, okay, cool, uh, yeah. Yeah, and Eugenia Walker, is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, she's. I mean, so if I can help in any way too, let me know. Wow, yeah, we love that. We love that a lot. Is this GSO kind of like the real store? Do we donate? Stuff yeah, yeah, you can take, yeah, and, and they'll sell it. I mean, it's for sale, um, but the proceeds instead of, I mean, it covers Janet's salary, and for the most part, everything other than that goes towards the community. And so, just to say, I mean, to me, this is impressive. Um, like during the quarantine stuff, she's still netted about, um, four thousand dollars that almost all of it i mean thirty eight hundred dollars of it probably went back into the community i mean that was it's not a set number it changes but she's done amazing and she does she has such a talent of knowing how to reach out to the people that are really destitute that will not will probably never go to a, a thing a church or any other place to ask for help but they need it and so um she's really good at that and so she has um part of that and i don't know if well, i answered your question household goods clothing yeah pretty much anything you like that yeah you could do it a goodwill yeah uh, and, and the goodwill is obviously a good thing and put some people to work and, and get, provides things this will be more local but it's the same concept um the people that work there are truly just volunteers um except for janet she's getting paid but she's doing so much more than just running a store um she spends a lot of her after hours going to help with the big five and head start and some of those things like that, getting them the things they need, providing even the hospital. I think she takes some clothes up to the hospital, for people that have been in wrecks and maybe got their clothes messed up. Where is the store? It's in the same location. So 20 East Cherokee. It's where the old King's House Church, if you're familiar with that, on between uh, Main and 2nd Street on Cherokee. Um, there's the thrift stores where the sanctuary used to be and all the shelter parks on the other side. Um, we'll, start there. well, that'd be great. And, and really, I don't know if, if we, if you could help us with buying a ticket or if you know somebody who'd be willing to buy a ticket, it'd be an awesome opportunity for us to help raise some money in that regard. So I hate to make it a sales pitch for it, but at the same time, <laughs> we'll make a sales pitch. We'd love to have some donations that maybe go towards, especially honed in them. You have a chance to win a, custom rifle so it's pretty cool looking you can gonna check it out when is the drawing it's um november 1st and the governor is going to do the drawing for us so that's kind of a neat thing um that'd be something if you want to bring to the blood drive and yeah, yeah drive. exactly i think it's a good idea yeah so uh, i'll have those up here <laughs> i know it's not for everybody i'm just saying if you like it or whatever hey anybody else have any thoughts or questions or anything else you want to mm -hmm. offer uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for letting me come out. And <laughs>